our uh, speaker right now is Professor uh, Rupa Manjari Ghosh. Uh, she will start off with the very uh, important issue on gender imbalance in higher education, physics and engineering and photonics. A little bit about Professor Ghosh. She's a researcher, teacher, orator, and an academic administrator. Uh, we know her, she's on our council, and so we see her quite often these days. Uh, Professor Ghosh has a BSc in Physics Honours and an MSc in Physics from the University of Calcutta and a very, very well-recognized PhD from the University of Rochester in New York, USA, where she worked as a Rush Rees Fellow and chosen for the outstanding scholarly ability and the promise of exceptional contributions in scholarship and teaching. Uh, her work is pioneering. She's worked with Professor L. Mandel on two-photon interference, which has yielded a new direction in quantum optics and quantum information in the creation and use of a source of entangled photon pairs and of single photons at the forefront of research today. Professor Ghosh is a former professor of physics and dean school of physical sciences at JNU New Delhi, where she occupied many other very important academic and administrative positions. She has held several visiting faculty scientist positions on invitation abroad and delivered numerous invited uh, research seminars all over the world. She is a recipient of the Sri Shakti Science Samman for her award for her original contribution in science. She serves as an expert in crucial DST, UGC, CSIR and DAE bodies and, um, and many, many more. Uh, she was, she co-chaired the FICCI Higher Education Committee for four years between 2018 and 21. She was the member of the Council of Ayuka. She's an external member of the Research Council of CSIR, CI, CSIO in Chandigarh, a member of the Governing Council of RRI, and has been invited as an expert to contribute to the NAC white paper on reimagining re the assessment and accreditation, accreditation in Indian Higher Education 2022. Quite an inspiration to all of us. She's asking me to stop, so I shall, because she'll give us a very interesting talk right now, Professor Thank you. Uh, I, uh, my special thanks to <coughs> Dr. Ashima Pradhan for first writing to make sure that I have the time, and then, of course, Urboshi. Her energy is uh, infectious. Uh, real thanks to Tarun, though he could not be here, for hosting me uh, nicely. Uh, the energy level in this room is already, I can feel. So, uh, you know, uh, I've been given a task by Urboshi. And I said, yes, sir, and I'll do that. So the issue of uh, gender imbalance, I've rephrased what she had told me. The women, uh, in a uh, status of women in uh, in India, in this particular field, particularly photonics. So I sort of spread that, stretch that a bit. So I'm going to touch upon, in the next half an hour, the issue of gender imbalance, and in my personal perspective, what I think are the issues, uh, and what we can do as individuals and as a group to address such things. So no physics talk today. Uh, I did give the first Pancharatnam lecture uh, in June, I think, standing right here. But today is a different agenda, and a very important agenda. So thank you very much, uh, Anita ji, for uh, hosting this. And you know, really nice to see so many young youngsters in the audience. So uh, I just want to uh, talk about some basic issues, and it's good to sort of write them down. So breaking barriers for gender equity, uh, today, if you look at this room and you would feel that women are playing a significant role in higher education today, but there are still barriers, and there are barriers that are often invisible. That makes them very hard, and I'm going to harp on this particular problem, unintentional, invisible, and that's the, really the problem. If you have a visible problem, you could actually handle it much easier. Uh, so this can prevent you from reaching your full potential. That's, again, the second thrust. Uh, I'm not worried about who goes where, but basically your potential, are you going to actually realize that? And everybody says that it's a question that we need gender parity. I'm going to talk on these uh, gender parity, my issues, later. But, you know, it's, uh, 
as was being stated by our uh, inaugural speaker very nicely, that uh, you don't look at at this slope uh, who is who, you just look at individuals. But there is a problem even with that, and I'm going to come to that. But each individual is unique, and the fact that we don't think alike, the fact that we are not the same, that's our strength in higher education. Because essentially for research, for generation of new idea, research doesn't have to be you know always blue sky abstract, though I did that. But the uh, point is that if there is conflict of ideas, then only new ideas emerge. So it's good that we don't think similarly. And the fact that we are all unique, uh, that's our strength. So we benefit the most from diversity. And this diversity I use not in the sense of just gender, in every real sense, even left brain to right brain, uh, mixing them up, diversity in the full form. That's our strength in higher education, and I'm going to limit myself because that's the domain I know well uh, in higher education only. So the real in challenge in an institution of higher learning this is not individual pursuit. We are not in the Himalayas doing our self whatever, right? So we are part of an institution. So the real challenge is to frame and support policies and systems that cater to and respect the uniqueness and choices of an individual. So whether you're a woman or any other gender. Now, that's uh, easier said than done, because we do not want anarchy. There is a fine line between anarchy and, and allowing full creative potential. So I think that's something, you know, I've been a vice chancellor for long, and sort of you know how to actually do this, and every day is a learning experience. So I'm going to basically talk about these issues as we progress. Uh, some statistics, I don't like to show statistics, though I study them a lot. There are other people who are very good at this. But I thought for today, I'll talk about gender imbalance in these three parameters that I studied last year. Uh, so I'm sure it's more or less the same, and you could actually fiddle and get India data as well. There are nice tools available in the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. So shocking, isn't it? Less than 30% of the world's researchers are women. Less than 30% of researchers. So surprising exception. I don't know whether there is any logic. If you do that tool, Bolivia, women account for 63% researchers. I don't know what is the reason. Uh, I used to think France is pretty good, but France is 26%. Ethiopia, another 8%. So uh, long association with uh, French collaborators. Uh, there are a lot of things that you see and you like. But if you look at the hard statistics, what, this is what it is. If you look at the APS data, so from researcher in general, I'm now coming to physics and engineering. They're normally clubbed together for their similarity. Uh, only about 20% of doctoral degrees are given to women. Shocking. AIP, if you look at it, American Institute of Physics, only 13% of all physics professors worldwide are female. So I just took through three sets of data. I don't want to show you all the tables. You know, you can do that any other time. But this is something I want us to remember. So the question that we are addressing probably is why it's still like this. Okay, so in spite of all good intentions to say, oh, things are changing, it's still like this. Uh, so you'd ask the question why, and people have answers for you, ready-made answers. Okay, so photonics, of course, as Urbursi said yesterday, is a strongly growing sector of economy and a major research area. Wherever there is high competition, there is a problem. And uh, a career in science, engineering, technology, this is known, right? That's the way children are groomed at home. It's a demanding and tough op option. Actually, all disciplines are demanding and tough options. It's just that we create a buzz around ourselves and we say, okay, there's a myth about physics. Uh, for this is tough for both men and women. There's nothing special about women. But then people, these two bulleted points that I have uh, written uh, are the things that people quote as reasons why there is still significant uh, less uh, you know, representation of women. Representation is a bad word, but anyway. Uh, so I think some things are natural. They should come naturally, and I think organically, and that's what we are going to do, but it will not happen overnight. People say women tend to avoid competitive situation, whereas men prefer competitive tasks. Do you agree? No. No. So this is uh, from uh, an article. People also talk about imposter syndrome. There's a lot of people who are working on this. 
I am not an expert on any of this anyway. I'm going to speak from my experience. I've studied this, but basically it says, this happens, this happens even to me. Okay, you feel that uh, you have self-doubt and fear that your own skills are not sufficient. Okay, and this happens to everybody. It happens to me, it happens to everybody. Now, uh, men also suffer from this. It's a struggle, but perhaps more women are affected. Again, I'm quoting, these are not my studies. Now, I feel that these conditions are primarily acquired through our socialization. You are not in a, a, you are in a patriarchal society, so this imposter uh, syndrome, the, uh, the competitive thing, whatever is said, is because you're conditioned to be like that. So uh, that's the why that comes from literature. I'm going to get a little more uh, in details, and probably you would associate with that so that there is, you would understand that you are not alone. We all have gone through it, so you feel that you are not alone. There are additional barriers which probably are unintentional. It's like a crowded bus. You step on somebody's and, uh, feet, and you don't even realize you're stepping on somebody's feet. Sometimes it's exactly that. So there are unintentional uh, additional barriers put up along the career path of women in science. Some women ignore them and move on, often at a very high personal cost. We don't talk about it. Okay, so this is the, the scenario. So according to me, Urvashi, what are our goals for this meeting? Uh, we need to increase participation and engagement of women in the optics and photonics community. Right? That's what Anita he would ask us to do. Uh, I would say, this may not be proper English, massification, I don't know. I liked it, I stole it from an economic seminar. But we need to feminize the higher education sector in general. Women leaders then emerge organically from such massification. Right now we talk about leadership a lot, and I'm going to, uh, I think I have a slide on that towards then. Because you, we need role models, but you know, if you really had uh, a feminized higher education sector, then leaders would emerge organically. Because that's not happening, you actually uh, uh, need to focus on leadership. So for now, leaders have to drive the change. If you are in a position, like some of us are, then you need to lead the chain of empowerment. And the stories of successful women in leadership like this conference would do, so that's what I have put as a goal for us. That may serve as inspiration, motivation, and model for others. You'd see that, you know, uh, you suffered similar stuff, some people have made it, so you figure out what works. The major goal of this meeting, I feel, is to build a new and strengthen existing networks, right? All of us should actually be in a network to develop strategies for and to sustain successful professional careers. So you heard that even yesterday, but I thought I'll just put it. For me, the fight all through JNU and SNU had been this. We need to prevent a division of men and women into two opposing interest groups. So all right-thinking people should be in this together. It's not that women raise and fight for women's issues. I hate that. It's not women's issues. There's a societal problem, and I'm going to talk about it in the in the next thing. But the point is that I wish there were more men, actually. That's one thing that I uh, defer. I really want to involve them. This is a uh, room full of converted, right? So they're already converted. So I think we need to really preach it to, uh, to everybody. And I think we need to prevent a division of men and women into two opposing interest groups. The interest is the same, right? The interest is the same for humanity. And I would tell you, not as a morality principle, I'm just going to come to that. Before that, these are the token things that we do. In our dream for a diverse, equitable, and inclusive world, this is what we do. There was a February, 11th February was celebrated as an International Day of Women and Girls in Science. If you did not know, next time look out for it. That's the goal was full and equal access and participation for women and girls in science. And this time, International Women's Day, as you know, happens every year, 8th of March. The uh, theme was gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Break the bias was the hashtag. So it speaks of a gender equal world, a world free of biases, stereotypes, and discrimination. 
then only it becomes sustainable. Now, <coughs> equality, gender equality, I quoted exactly, I have problems with that. So the point I'm making is in higher education, every individual is unique and you recognize that. So we are not equal. Equity is the word. The fact that we are not equal, we are not identical, we don't need to be somebody else. And I'm going to harp on that. Hopefully these points would stay with you. And this also, of course, uh, if you look at UN Sustainable Development Goal, Goal 5 is about gender equality and empower all women and girls, etc., etc. So the major thing is equal participation in decision making. That's what you have to do, decision making. It cannot be all men's club. In decision making, it has to be equity of all genders. So the obstacles are, I, as I mentioned already, our socialization, conscious and unconscious biases, which are dangerous, stated and unstated discriminations. Uh, there are unfounded biases. You know, I don't know how many of you heard, but when I first time went to the US, I was the only uh, woman in my class, a PhD. Uh, the same thing happened when I joined JNU. I was the only woman in the faculty for a very long time, and you would all uh, have the same story. And I was told that physics is a male subject. What the hell? I mean, really. So only certain types of jaw, soft jaws are appropriate for women. You restrict them to school and now college teaching or some secretarial work. You know, that's what you do, right? <laughs> Things have changed, but you know, this mindset is still there. And in our case, uh, oh, there is a nice article, I don't know, it's dated now, but I, the getting girls into physics, this EPS editorial, or it says, are we saying the wrong things? This is an article you should read probably properly. I have not done justice to it. But the phrase I really like, I have quoted here, we continue to treat girls as their proto-boys. You know, in medical science, when they used to test medicines, uh, they would have only subjects that are male, and they would scale the weight, body weight, to apply it to females. <laughs> we are just the same. You just scale down versions of male. So, Girls to be treated as proto-boys is really the main problem, and I think this would need a lot of work, a lot of talk. Uh, the other thing, of course, you need to have a godfather or a godmother in India. I did my PhD abroad. I did not have it. So this is a network that's sorely needed if you take your first steps in the professional domain. Don't be uh, you know, afraid of this. Don't be ashamed of this that you need somebody to latch on to. That's not the way it is. It's true for everybody. Okay. And there is, of course, institutional sexism. I have many stories. So depending on the time I was telling Urvashi, I'll skip some of the anecdotes. I have many, many, many stories. So of course, women have to work harder than their male colleagues to convince their colleagues and superiors of their ability. This is true even for women who are judging you. Same CV, same kind of CV. Uh, of course, you are very few of them. And I was the only one in the faculty in JNU. I was noticed a lot. When I was the only PhD student who was being video recorded in a conference in Baltimore, of course, I was wondering, Joy, you would remember, uh, that I used to wonder whether uh, they're videographing me because uh, my physics is not that good or I'm a specimen from the zoo. <laughs> so I was the only one who was videotaped. And you know, the work is what uh, Ranjani mentioned. But so you are there are very few of us, and so we are noticed more easily. Sometimes that goes in your favor, <laughs> and sometimes it goes against you. So that's the reality, and we need to work on it. There is institutional sexism, same kind of CVs. Um, for the guy, people would say, my colleagues would say, oh, guy is a genius. Uh, for the same kind of CV from a woman, they would say, oh, she's very hardworking. Uh, I would say, what? <laughs> So how do you know that one is a genius and this one is hardworking? So uh, the idea is that oh, her supervisor, her supervisor was a great guy. So the guy's supervisor was also a great guy. But the assumption is that uh, you know the girl got molded into that and very hardworking. She caught up, whereas the boy is a genius. So they don't even notice that they're doing it. Okay, there's institutional sexism. So when you get into that position, you really need to break it and strike it really hard to, uh, to make a point. And sometimes that gets a little ugly, but what to do? In general, there are very poor working conditions. I'll not go through this. Time is running out. You know, This is such a topic that 
I can talk for hours on and have a discussion. There are many things that you know uh, already, security being one in India. Uh, my good friends would, would ask me even today that my daughter really wants to study physics, but looking at you, I'm scared because you have to work late night and you, know, you are at lab. And when I just started, my first student, I did not have a car. I had some uh, socialist principles that I applied on myself. I did not buy a car. And uh, my student had to give me a ride on his uh, rickety scooter for us late night to come back from outside the campus, inside the campus, that's where physical sciences was. But anyway, so there, these are issues that probably you know everybody talks about it. So what I talk about is creative leadership and what it means really for each one of you in your own sphere. Uh, creative leadership refers to be able to lead your team even when the path is unknown. So give a purpose to your team when everything else is changing. You saw that in, during COVID, didn't you? But COVID is not a one-off incident. So uh, I'm a product of a generation <coughs> where some of us have so-called made it, uh, in spite of the system and not because of the system. Right? That's what has to change. And more and more, I got into Shivnara University, basically because I wanted to change this for my next generation. Okay, it should not be the mother-in-law syndrome. I suffered, so I make my daughter-in-law suffer. So you suffered, so you make sure your daughter-in-law doesn't suffer. So uh, the basic thing in higher education, because we are a privileged sector, this is not primary education we are talking about. In higher education and research, you have to strive for excellence in whatever you do. And that excellence is your bar, not given by somebody else. Push yourself to your full potential, and then the system should cater to that. So this had to be actually done. And uh, why sh should the society bother? I thought that's an important point for us to remember, that uh, scientific progress is only possible and greatly accelerated if you have gender equality. That's what people say. Again, this is not my phrase. What I say is a gender equal, or I would say a gender rich. A gender rich society is both desirable and beneficial, and I'm coming to that. Gender rich. Doesn't have to be equal, but it must understand everybody's the differences. Why should the society bother? And I've been saying this for quite some time now. When you, for example, you are in a selection committee, you try to engage the very best people and not just the best men and the next best men and the next best men. If you want to stay competitive in business, you need to employ the best people. And the, the, it, in today's world, we cannot be competitive in a global economy if half, less than half, of our human capital is not allowed the opportunity to work up to its potential. It makes perfect sense, right? Uh, there is an article in Harvard Business Review in November 2016. The title of it is something like Diverse Teams Are Smarter. And this is what I was saying. It's just not the morally correct thing to do, but it actually makes perfect business sense to practice diversity and inclusivity. Right? And it makes perfect business sense to promote diverse teams. So this diversity doesn't have to be only on gender. But they, they, uh, their examples were only companies, but they apply to all higher education institutions. I've studied it very carefully. So diverse teams are smarter. Okay, it makes business sense to promote diversity. It's not just the morally correct thing to do. I want you to remember this. I can even give you the reference. So in India, very quickly, officially stated hiring policies have no gender bias, right? That's a great thing. I mean, very proud of it. And official norms and procedures are not discriminatory. Very proud of that. But does that mean that everything is okay dirt? Here, discrimination is subtle and indirect. And that's where we all have to be recognizing this. You now, there is a deficit of trained manpower in critical sectors that everybody recognizes. And we are not getting the maximum benefit from women's skills, experience, and commitment. So, Essentially, I would skip the examples. I have many stories, as I said. But main concerns are of these conscious and unconscious biases and unstated discriminations. 
and you have to be very conscious of it, like the, uh, the selection committee CVs I talked about. So of course there's a very big thing to say the society has to change the mindset, the attitude, culture, practice in the workplace that have to change. The working condition should be more gen the sensitive that goes for both genders actually. We don't do that well for our male colleagues either. Uh, the faith and trust are missing. Once in JNU, uh, there's a committee that was formed that has all women. And I was uh, in the elevator with the vice chancellor, I would not name him, famous economist. And he says, Rupa, uh, why you have chosen all women? So I said, there are many committees you have chosen were all men. So we don't, uh, <laughs> we don't trust each other. It, I actually did not purposely do it. Honestly, I did not purposely choose three women. I just looked at, I said, OK, that one suits, that one suits, who is available. And so there's a three-member committee for something. So uh, the faith and trust are missing. For women's issues, many of my women colleagues in JNU would not trust an all-male committee either, because we don't trust each other. We don't have faith on each other. <laughs> and uh, particularly for women committees like this, uh, women colleagues are thought to be less capable of being fair in their judgments, particularly for their gender issues. People are scared. I mean, what is there to be scared of? So we are unable to have this balance Institutionally, I'm not talking about one-on-one. -on -one. Institutionally, this is shocking to me, that it still is like this. So obviously, but sometimes you have to make statements about the obvious. And then people should realize, any individual should be able to work in and contribute to the academic life on campus, right? To the extent and at the level appropriate to personal choices and abilities. Your choice, your ability. And that should happen without gender as a constraint, because then the institution doesn't benefit fully. Right? So that's the obvious thing. There is a lot of things that uh, we have done. But what was being talked about uh, that I felt yesterday, uh, what Kiran was talking about, technology could be a great leveler, right? Your body strength, whether you're a thin boy or a strong boy, should not matter, right? I could not lift a pump when I was a PhD student. I had to call the boy next door saying, Kardu. When the pumps got better, <laughs> of course, right? So technology is a great leveler. You can drive a truck. It's not a problem. Physical abilities of men, women, any individual, you know, it doesn't seem to matter much. So I think we need to focus on this and keep that as a, on our agenda. And the point I've written on top is my favorite. It's not just about treating everyone equally. It's about understanding the differences naturally. You have to be rational to understand the natural differences between two, two humans. But what I'm talking about is men and women. So you ensure equity and make the best of everyone's abilities and choices. So understanding our differences rationally is the key to what I'm going to what I'm talking about. I quickly touch upon this issue that uh, some of you were talking to me about work-life balance. Well, that's a myth. <laughs> if you try to, this I feel is an elusive concept. It can only lead to mediocrity or career break or dissatisfaction on both fronts. So sometimes this, sometimes that. Work is not outside your life. Right? But at the same time, you have to have personal uh, time, and that's extremely important, personal time. And the key is to find the right kind of support. That's the only way, and this is true for all genders. So uh, don't try to strive any work-life balance. That balance leads to mediocrity. Okay, you are unhappy on both sides. At home, whew, uh, you always have this complex, I'm not doing enough. And at work, you have this complex that you're not doing enough. So what, what is the point? Point is that if I have a uh, experiment, an experiment running, I'm there 20, 48 hours. Home is neglected a bit. Next time when I need something to be done for my granddaughter, I'm home 48 hours. That's the way things work out. And for that, you need to find support. This cannot be done if you are doing it alone. So I think that we must remember, and that's the key to the success. As I said, uh, diverse teams are smarter, so institutionally, we often try to do many affirmative actions. So any form is welcome, you would think. But sometimes they're very strange. 
Uh, I, uh, I'll skip some of this, but this is a problem that we must keep in mind because this is going to hit you. This is the reason for the leaky pipe, so to say. The policy is, uh, I think, should be fair and gender rich, not gender blind. Uh, there is something that came up, maternity leave policies. You know, if you are out of your bench for as long as they prescribe now, you'd lose your scientific career. <laughs> it's stupid. Well, I think instead, maternity leave should be called family leave, and we should not get into the family to say who does what. The certain things only women can do, so that of course will happen, but the support, why do you want to get into the family and say who takes leave to do what? Let them decide. Keep it family leave. Give them the leave that you want. Let them figure it out. What fights they want to have. You don't want to get into this, right? So the point is, this is extremely important because it recognizes uh, that it's a unit of family and it's not a burden on the women alone to raise children, for example, right? So there is a lot that we have been talking about for quite some time. I've been saying this for quite some time, and there's some issues in there. Anyway, I'll skip this part because I think most of you know and probably will talk about it. You need to have certain uh, systems in place to avoid sexual harassment. Uh, first time, you know, 2001, I was the chair of the gender committee in JNU. I was thrown into it. I did not know anything about it. And uh, we wrote the first rules and procedures that became a standard uh, in India. Uh, some people would come to me to say, uh, my Students are from very good families. This doesn't happen. <laughs> so sexual harassment uh, is a taboo to talk about as if it doesn't happen. The idea is uh, to prevent it in a systematic way. Okay? So of course, all of that happened. Uh, the internal complaints committee. So it needs to, you really need to have a violence-free campus and zero tolerance for harassment and discrimination. This should be visible. I would not get into that. There are many myths, you know, I give talks on this, but the, that, those are long ones. Uh, so people think that sexual harassment is really just harmless flirtation. There's a very big difference between flirting and harassing. Okay, flirting is feel good for both parties. Harassment is one person is feeling uncomfortable. <coughs> so the point that I wanted to actually you to remember, the sexual harassment is never funny. It is the effect on the victim, not the intention of the offender that defines an action of sexual harassment. Very important to remember. Oh, I did not intend it, big deal. I got offended, so that matters. Okay, so this is something that, you know, I can go on and on, but let me just tell you the simple sum is that we need to treat one another with respect and we need to ensure our right to work and live with dignity. That's the real sum of all that I'm going to talk about. There are, of course, uh, women's cells, and this in all universities almost. Um, you should not just think of your role as fighting gender cases, but advocacy is more important. Okay, so prevention. So uh, role models, as I said, there is only one slide, I'll stop with this. We still have very few role models of women leaders in higher education. Women who make it to the top have a major role to play in empowering other women. Leaders have to drive the change and lead the chain of empowerment. Please remember this. And don't you think that leader is somebody else? Each one of you. I like this, and this is what I try to practice. A successful person finds the right place for himself. A successful leader finds the right place for others. Okay, And this is actually... Uh, not just trying to do it for the benefit of others, not selflessly, okay? It's so that the system as a whole becomes better and then you benefit because you then perform in a better system. So um, I no longer build my own CV, I build the CVs of others. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So I can go on and on, but thank you very much for listening to me. Today. Thank you, Professor Ghosh, for a very nice talk. And I'm sure the questions will go on and on. But then yeah. uh, I think we have time for about uh, two questions. So I have a question about uh, parental leave and family leave. Yes. What will it take to make that change uh, in India? 
Yes, for example, I had full responsibility of uh, the university that I was heading, right? Even then, there is a problem because the government of India has uh, certain rules already laid, laid down. And that, un so we called it family leave in S SNU, but we know I have to actually copy paste exactly what the government says. So I think there is a problem also of, you know, just they thought they're doing good by uh, just giving a very uh, long maternity leave to women. These are all well-meaning but bad policies. And people have to continuously tell them it's bad, it's bad, and bad, and change it. So that it's, in India, these things are government control. Even in private institutions? Uh, yes, because ultimately, if I'm taken to court, uh, I have to fall back on that law. So even in private institutions. I have some flexibility, but could not do beyond the point. The HR would object. So if I can add something to that. So we also have something now called child care leave. So the mother, a mother, can take leave up to two years for two children till they turn 18. So in one conference on gender issues, I had actually suggested that this should be shared between both parents. And I was met with very derisive guffaws. And this was about seven or eight years ago. Nothing has happened. So yeah, I mean, I think we have to push constantly and maybe one day. Yes. I helped initiate that in my institution um, more than a decade ago now, time-wise. But we call it parental leave, and yes. it can be taken by either parent. It can be for adopted or biological. Uh, that also becomes important, as long as the person agrees and commits to be the primary caregiver of the child. So that's the main key, right? Uh, yeah. Sometimes you can get maternity leave because you give birth and you have to recover health-wise. That's the medical concept as opposed to the social concept, Absolutely. which is caregiving no, I, I, itself. I quoted some uh, countries where we have, I have even supplied to the government, these are the rules. Yeah. But uh, you know, it needs advocacy and probably with your help. The mentality has to change. Yes, yeah, definitely. It sounds like there needs to be lobbying efforts into the government. Thank you. Thank you. There's another one from the back. How can you define feminism? Feminism? Ha. Uh, Maybe example, even men can, can be feminist. Do you understand that? That's yeah. your definition. Yeah. Because it's a most um, ill-used word. Yes, you know, I, I'm a physicist not really into these kind of definitions. I would say, like, I've been proposing definitions. Okay. So I'd like to make my own uh, yeah, definition. Sorry, what's your uh, so uh, I actually don't like the word much, because humanism is my definition. And that includes all the principles that we are talking about. And uh, I, I, you don't need to really, uh, women don't need reservations. Affirmative actions are different, right? That's women do not need that extra push. Because then people look at you and say, well, you have come from that channel. And I think it's initially you need to have some affirmative actions. I have some ideas about what, and we did some in SNU. But uh, affirmative action doesn't mean reservation. It doesn't mean giving extra benefits of that kind, other than natural things that I'm talking about, that accept it. I mean, a pregnant woman walks to your office uh, as a postdoc researcher, you are uncomfortable. It's not a problem of the woman. <laughs> it's natural to give birth to babies. I mean, big deal. So you are uncomfortable. And I think that's something people have to get used to it. This is natural. What's a big deal about it, really? And you figure it out. Of course, there is a financial thing. I, I had written it, but I glossed over it. Paying for the same work twice the salary of two people when somebody is only. These are problems of small organization, even like mine. But when you have a boss who is authority, and you say, I'll sanction an extra post for that. Those financial things are important. But this, that's why it's important for the society to understand it as a whole and not treat it like uh, an individual's problem, individual institution's problem. So I think that's uh, important. And get the support. People pitch in, right, don't you? I mean, I had a colleague, male colleague, who had a heart attack. Unfortunately, uh, I, I was the dean. I still took extra course to teach. So don't you do that? Because somebody has heart attack is not, I'm not equating that with childbirth. But I'm saying that things happen. <laughs> <laughs> Things happen, you know pitch in, don't you? 
So what is the problem really? You pitch in when you, there is a need. So you pitch in and this has to be systematically done because it's a general trend. Has to be done systematically. Anyway, I think for the sake okay. of time. Yes, we have many more questions and oh, there's just one more. You will be aware of that Gadi initiative of Government of India. So if you maybe it will give some idea to the audience if you can briefly. Yeah, but I think maybe some of the time maybe you should say. But uh, yeah, there, there are initiatives taken. Every issue, if I take on, I would also criticize it a bit. So <laughs> that's a very recent. I think it is very useful. Maybe yeah, it, uh, but, only 30 institutions have been selected on that. Yes. Probably many will would not Pepino be knowing Johnny, about uh, Yeah. So. I was part of formulating that. <laughs> so uh, the government has come up with something. But uh, that's more about leadership. They count how many deans, how many head of the department should in step. So, uh, but let's see uh, whether that yields results. It's, it's uh, following the UK model a bit. Uh, but let's see how, whether it works here. And then uh, I think next time we meet, we should analyze it. Yes? OK. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So let us uh, thank our speaker again.